Hello, good afternoon, welcome back. Oh, it looks like people are out sick with coronavirus. Well, that's good, you shouldn't come in if you're sick. Don't spread it to other people. So I think you know that uh, this virus is spreading outside of China quite extensively now. A couple of things. Look at the cases, 4,300 in South Korea, 2,000 in Italy, 1,500 Iran. Here in the US, we have now 100. You know, last week when I left you, we had 50 or something. Now, 45 of those people came off the cruise ship. However, we're starting to have local transmission. So let's take a look at this graph. So the China line has evened out. And the bottom, which is global, is going up now. Remember, that was flat for a long time. And if we look at daily cases, you see the China outbreak subsided on a daily basis. And then the, it's going back up again because it's spread elsewhere. So I don't know how many we're going to have, but figure China had 80,000 with incredible travel restriction. And we're not going to do that here. So we may have more. There's one thing I wanted to point out. There have been a couple of cases in Washington, out in the Northwest. And it got into an assisted living facility. I think four people have died already. That's the problem. That's the age population that, in which this is going to be lethal. But the interesting thing about the Washington outbreak, if you remember, there was a case in January. Someone returned from Wuhan, and they got sick. Uh, he was a young person, so he recovered. But he was quarantined until he recovered. And then they traced all his contacts on the plane when he came back here. None of them got infected. And then last week, we started to have new local infections. There was one infection where there was no apparent travel, no contact with any sick person. So that means the virus is, is, is circulating silently, which means people aren't getting sick or not, or it may be flu or something else, and they're not, this is winter, right? And they're not going for medical help. But when they sequence the genomes of these viruses, they can see that they both are, have, are similar. So when the virus came over here, it, it mutates from host to host, as we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. And you get a hallmark mutations that you can use to track. And both isolates from Washington have that same mutation, which means it's been circulating in Washington for about six weeks. I, I suspect it's here. I look at people, and I look for coronavirus in them. <laughs> I'm sure it's here. And I think a lot of people get colds and flu during the winter, and they'll never end up getting diagnosed unless you're really sick, and you go to a hospital, and then Maybe you'll get diagnosed, but we can expect more in the coming months. This little virus, not so little, 29,000 base pairs, is bringing the world to its knees. It's amazing. And you know what? This could have all been prevented if we had been doing some research. And the problem is when, when it's not infecting people, nobody cares. And it's hard to get funds to do the right experiments. We could have had antivirals ready for this broadly acting coronavirus antivirals. But no company wants to invest in it because it's not profitable. And that's an indictment of our healthcare system. We depend on for-profit entities to make antivirals and vaccines. That's why we're in the situation we're in now. And the NIH budget isn't high enough to do all this work. Today I want to end up our reproductive cycle by talking about what I call the infected cell. And what this is, is, you know, when, when viruses infect cells, we've talked all about how they get into cells, how they make new genomes, proteins, assemble new particles, and so forth. All of that needs a lot of energy. You need to have proteins, you need to have lipids, you need to have triphosphate, you need to have energy. And what we're going to see today is what viruses do to cells to have all of that available for them. To, they, they alter the metabolism of cells so that they can get what they need. And this is a pretty new field. This lecture wasn't in this course until a couple of years ago because we didn't know anything about this. But now using new techniques, we can look at infected cells and see how things change on a global basis. I don't know if you know this, but there's you know, there's genomics and transcriptomics and proteomics. We can look at everything that changes in a cell. There's also metabolomics. We can extract all the small molecules 
and see how they change. Do mass spec and look at an infected cell and see how they change. So that's the, why we're able to now look at cells and go, oh my gosh, the virus is really doing something substantial to them. So that's what we're going to talk about today. That's why I call it the infected cell. It's an overview. I want to talk about four different areas. I want to talk about signal transduction and how it relates to infection, gene expression, regulation, metabolism, and remodeling of cellular organelles. So let's start with signal transduction. So on the left is a, is a diagram of just one part of one signaling pathway in the cell, which involves uh, AKT here. And that's a, pro a hub protein that it takes inputs from a lot of sources and outputs to different processes in the cell. And this illustrates the fact that without even having a virus in them, cells have to sense their environment and respond. Right? If there are nutrients in the environment, those nutrients can bind cell surface receptors, and they can start signaling pathways which lead to cell growth. I don't want you memorizing pathways like this. I just want you to get the concept that cells have these pathways to regulate growth. So here, for example, there are receptors on the cell surface. If they engage a growth factor, th that starts a signaling cascade, which would then lead to translation of mRNA, cell proliferation, and inhibition of autophagy, programmed cell death. And viruses can tap into this. They can modulate these signaling pathways for their own purposes. And I want to show you a couple of examples of that, how that happens today. So this is a normal pathway in the cell. And this is just one. As there are many, many different pathways. And you can see here, and by the way, whenever I show these kinds of pathways, a green arrow means stimulate and a red means inhibit. And sometimes it's a little confusing. You know, a green arrow will stimulate something which then inhibits something else. It sometimes gets a little confusing. But you can see on this slide, these are different viral proteins that can interface on this particular signaling pathway. And so some of the proteins can stimulate PI3K, PI3 kinase, which feeds in, this feeds off directly from signals at the membrane and turns on subsequent pathways. Some can stimulate AKT itself, others inhibit. And down here even you have stimulation. So that's what I mean when I say virus infections can change signaling to promote replication. So in general you want to promote protein synthesis and cell division, inhibit cell death like autophagy. So here are three examples of signaling pathways that impinge or affect virus entry. Now we talked about how viruses bind to cell surface receptors and endocytosis may take them into cells, but we didn't really consider the fact that that binding actually initiates signaling pathways that facilitate uptake of the particle. And that's what these three examples show here. So on the left, we actually did visit this adenovirus binding to the cell surface. Initially, the fiber binds to a fiber receptor on the surface. Uh, that brings it into a coated pit, precursor to an endosome. Uh, and then the virus binds a second receptor, and that brings it in and leads to the uncoating process. But the binding of that of virus to that second receptor, which is an integrin, initiates a signaling pathway shown by the green arrows here. And it goes through a number of signaling proteins, including PI3K, but the ultimate effect is to disassemble the microfilaments, the actin microfilaments underneath the plasma membrane. Because remember, for uh, vesicles to move from the plasma membrane, they're not just diffusing, they have to move on tracks, but the initial part of getting past the PM you have to get past that actin microfilament. So this signaling disassembles the, or loosens it so that the endosome can get past it. And that's all because of the virus binding to its integrin receptor. Another example in the middle, we have influenza virus binding to the cell surface. Again, binding initiates signaling pathways. And again, you don't need to know the proteins involved here, but just understand that the signaling will also loosen up the actin filament structure there. And it also uh, leads to the activation of these proton pumps 
that pump protons into the endosome, because as these endosomes move in, they acidify, and the acidification is stimulated by signaling as a consequence of virus infection. Virus binding not only stimulates the receptor, or through the receptor, but it also causes clustering of these receptor protein tyrosine kinases, RPTK, uh, and they cluster and they become activated and they participate in signaling as well. And you remember that the getting protons into the endosome, they eventually get in the virus particle and they allow the ribonuclear protein to get out when the membranes fuse. And the last part of this panel here is that the virus also appears to bind to voltage-dependent calcium channels on the cell surface. This is not a means of entry. The virus just stays on the surface, but the binding causes calcium to come into cells, and that seems to be important for release of the ribonuclear protein from the virus particle as well. So again, a lot of signaling involved in entry. And finally, on the right, an Ebola virus particle is binding uh, on the surface, and it's being taken up by macropenocytosis. This interaction leads, again, to a signaling pathway through AKT and mykinase here, RAC. That facilitates movement of the endosome. And what's cool here is that RAC inhibits the transit from the endosome to the lysosome. It inhibits that, so the, and remember the virus is escaping from the endosome, it doesn't want to go to the lysosome, otherwise it would be degraded. And RAC makes sure that's happening by inhibiting the last step, the endosome to lysosome fusion. All right, so signaling involved in virus uptake. And all these examples have in common PI3 kinase. Here's another two examples of the importance of PI3K and what we call the mTOR relay. mTOR is a protein assembly downstream of all of these steps that is a regulator, a master regulator of translation downstream of AKT. And you can see here two examples of uh, different viral proteins activating PI3K. So here, hepatitis C virus, adenovirus, uh, rotavirus, these are all viral proteins that are interfacing with PI3K and they're initiating signaling. This HCMV, human cytomegalovirus protein, can activate AKT directly. So the green arrows mean it's activating it. Uh, that would block apoptosis activation of AKT, which is good. You don't want the cell to die. Uh, and it is uh, causing upregulation of translation through mTOR. And again, on the right, this is a few different proteins here, hepatitis B virus, human herpes virus 8, which encodes a G protein coupled receptor on the cell surface. All of these are stimulating AKT. That leads to cell division. So cyclins regulate cell divisions uh, and translation and block uh, apoptosis. All right, so these are focal uh, hubs in the growth of the cell and they can be activated by viral infection. Another interface with AKT is quite interesting, shown on this slide, and this involves flaviviruses. Slavy is, of course, West Nile, dengue virus, yellow fever virus, plus stranded RNA envelope viruses. Here's the genome in the middle. It's a plus stranded RNA, encodes a long open reading frame, which is processed by proteases to give you the final proteins. And when this RNA is in cells, as we'll see in a moment, cells have a vigorous anti-RNA defense in the form of nucleases that chew up foreign RNAs. And in this particular case, here's a, here's a diagram of the viral genome on the left side. And it's not to scale. The open reading frame, which is most of the RNA, is just compressed so that we can see the five and three prime non-coding regions or untranslated regions. And this RNA is attacked by a five prime N nuclease, exonuclease called XRN1. And XRN1 chews most of the RNA up. Now, obviously, this doesn't happen to every RNA. Otherwise, there'd be no virus infection. It turns out that that's good for the virus because the XO, XRN1 gets past the open reading frame and then it stops. There's a stem loop structure at the beginning of the three prime UTR that blocks XRN1 and it can't digest it. So you're left with this RNA, which is called SFRNA, subgenomic flavivirus RNA, and it's just the three prime 
untranslated region. Well, it turns out that if you make mutations in the three prime UTR that allow XRN1 to chew it all up, the virus will not form plaques and it won't cause disease in mice. And here's the experiment on the right, it's a plaque assay. Wild type virus forms nice plaques. If you, again, make it so that XRN1 can chew up all of this three prime UTR, the virus doesn't form plaques. It's, it can still replicate, but it's not cytopathic. And in mice, it doesn't cause disease. And what, what others have subsequently found out is that this RNA inactivates AKT and promotes apoptosis. So let's go back and see here. AKT is normally blocking apoptosis. So if you inactivate AKT, apoptosis proceeds, and that's why you get plaque formation, cell death, and that's why you get uh, disease in mice. So a uh, little RNA is interfacing with AKT to bring about the changes in the cell needed for the virus to get out and spread. All right, so that's signaling. That's all I want to talk about signaling today. There are many, many examples, but I want you to get the principle that viruses can interface with signaling pathways to manipulate cell growth so they are able to replicate. Because remember, viruses do not replicate well in quiescent cells, and they also need building blocks that are made in a growing cell. Viruses also interfere with cellular gene expression. And we're gonna talk about this at the RNA and protein level. Here is a, a scheme that we saw before. This is how mRNAs are made in eukaryotic cells. So we have a, a DNA of the cell up at the top there. It has a promoter at the left end. Remember you make a precursor, a, a primary messenger RNA, which is polydentylated, spliced, and then it's exported into the cytoplasm where it will then be translated. And viruses interfere, viral gene products interfere at every step of this process. And those are the red letters that you can see on the left. So transcription, polio, VSV, alpha virus, proteins, interfere with transcription by Paul II. In the case of polio, it also interferes with Paul 1 and 3. It shuts down all cellular RNA synthesis. And it does so by cleaving. Its protease cleaves transcription factors. It doesn't touch the polymerase. It cleaves the transcription factors that are needed, and particular Tata box binding protein, which is essential for promoters and others. Now, why, you may say, would it do that? Well, that way, the translational apparatus is all for the virus. There's not going to be any cellular mRNAs competing for translation. And then some viruses interfere with polyadenylation. Some viruses, viral proteins, interfere with splicing. Some interfere with RNA export. <laughs> it's really remarkable. And as we'll see in a bit, uh, some viral proteins inhibit translation. So, you know, when you inhibit RNA synthesis, there are some long-lived mRNAs that are going to stick around for a while. So just inhibit translation so you don't have to compete. Your RNAs would have to compete with those. And finally, there are viral proteins, including a coronavirus protein and others that degrade cellular mRNAs. It chops them up into pieces. We'll see how that happens in a bit. So you basically wipe out the cell's transcriptional apparatus. Now, one virus doesn't do all of these typically, it does one or, or a few of them, but the end result is you reduce competition of cellular RNAs with viral mRNAs for the translation machinery. I think also you free up NTPs that are needed to make more mRNAs. Here's a little detailed look at the interference with mRNA processing and export. So we're looking at a, a pre-mRNA at the top there. It still has an intron in it. And remember, in order for that to be spliced, it binds a number of different proteins that facilitate splicing. And then those proteins are recognized by the nuclear export machinery to get them out of the nucleus into the cytosol. And viruses, as we already saw in the previous slide, interfere with all these steps here. A herpes simplex protein interferes with splicing. And, there, and polydentylation and so forth, we saw in the previous slide. But here on this slide, there are a number of 
uh, viral proteins that inhibit export. So we have adenovirus proteins, and the, the red bar is going to the nuclear pore. We have VSV proteins inhibiting export. We have influenza virus proteins inhibiting export, as well as polyadenylation of cell mRNAs. And then we have a polio and rhinovirus protease, which cleaves NUPS. NUPS are components of the export machinery. And when you cleave them, you destroy export function. And in fact, when, when this happens, many nuclear proteins just flow out into the cytoplasm and they become available for viral replication. So again, reducing competition for your own messenger RNAs, taking over the cell. I mentioned uh, a few moments ago that cells mount a defense against viral mRNAs, and that's shown on this slide. We, in our cells, even uninfected cells, we have a system to turn over mRNAs. Remember, I mentioned a long time ago that mRNAs don't last forever. No mRNA lasts forever. And there are systems in the cell to turn them over. Some turn over more quickly than others. And this is the system right here, which comprises a number of nucleases that do both five and three prime exonuclease digestion. So here's an mRNA top left there with an open reading frame. It's capped and polyadenylated. And in order for cell mRNAs to be degraded, and there are in fact signals in the RNAs that dictate whether it gets degraded or not, first the, the poly A is removed by a, a complex which includes PAM, which is poly A nuclease, digests off the three prime poly A, and then the cap is removed and then these, these RNAs can be digested. So if you remove the cap, you can now go in uh, with XRN1, and the cap is removed by a number of enzymes. DCP stands for decapping enzyme, and they remove the cap, and now XRN1 can chew in from the five prime N, and the cap would otherwise block that. That's why you have to remove uh, the cap. And uh, that's why Hepatitis C virus RNA without MIR-122 bound to it is degraded by XRN1. With MIR-122, it doesn't get degraded. That's something we talked about a couple of lectures ago. And you can also have three, three to five prime decay uh, by, in this case, an exosome or DCPS. They're both doing that and degraded from one end or the other. The result is the mRNA, of course, is gone. Now, of course, when viruses infect cells, they would be degraded by these machineries, and so this machinery is either removed by virus infectant or relocalized, put somewhere else so that it won't degrade viral RNAs, otherwise there would be no virus infection. Here's one example. In poliovirus infected cells, these uh, enzymes, PAN, DCP1, and XRN1, so PAN, the poly A nuclease, DCP1, the capping enzyme, and XRN1, they're all degraded, so they can't work. That has to be done, otherwise the virus uh, would not be able to replicate. All right, so the virus gets, viruses get around that de degradation by messing with those enzymes. However, some viruses co-opt these mRNA degradation enzymes to degrade cellular mRNA, and that's shown on, on this slide. Um, and in fact, many viruses have encoded in their genomes proteins that degrade RNA. So here is a translating mRNA. There's a cap and a poly A tail, and there's a, a ribosome translating it. We have three viral proteins here, one from SARS coronavirus called NSP1, and a human herpes virus 8, SOX protein, and a herpes simplex VHS protein. These are viral proteins, and they are going to trash this cellular mRNA. And so the VHS and SOX and NSP1 are cutting near the cap to remove the cap, and that lets XRN1 come in. So it uses XRN1, but it prepares it by encoding its own decapping enzymes, because in some cases viruses are trashing those decapping enzymes. And so the result is a chewed up RNA from the five prime end. Vaccinia virus has two proteins that are decapping enzymes, and they take off the cap, and again, XRN1 can go in and chew it up. So both counters to cellular 
uh, mRNA degradation enzymes, as well as proteins encoded in virus genomes that, rec that start the process of degrading uh, the RNAs. Our first question is, which of the following is a consequence of viral proteins modifying signal transduction pathways to promote replication? A, polio inhibition of transcription by Paul II. B, herpes simplex virus protein blocking pre-mRNA splicing. C, disruption of actin filaments to allow endocytosis. Or D, initiation of mRNA degradation by viral protein. So which is a consequence of modification of signal transduction proteins. All right, how did we do here? So most of you got the right answer, which is C, disruption of actin filaments to allow endocytosis. The other three are right, but they don't involve signal transduction. They involve direct action of viral proteins. So the one C, disruption of actin filaments, that occurs when the viruses bind receptors and signaling occurs to disrupt the filaments. Remember this slide? The Baltimore scheme. We, we made the Baltimore scheme, and we didn't. Baltimore made a scheme. You put mRNA in the middle because all viruses need to synthesize mRNA that can be recognized by the cell translation machinery. So that's common to all these viruses. None of them encodes a complete translation system. So now let's take a look at some ways that viruses alter the translation system of the host so it favors the translation of their mRNAs, right? So that's a good way, another good way to make sure everything is devoted to virus. It's quite insidious, right? These are real parasites. They're taking things away from the host. Just to remind you, I'm sure you learned translation before, but I doubt you remember it. You probably remember there's a ribosome and tRNAs, right? But let's, let's look at the mechanics so that we can see how viruses perturb it. So the top is an mRNA with an AUG codon, which is the initiator of translation. And the way the ribosome is brought here is by a very big protein assembly nucleated by EIF4E, which is the cap binding protein. So most mRNAs destined to be translated have a cap. There's a really nice exception, which we'll see today. And the cap, its function is to bring 4E, 4E binds, and then 4E is attached to all these other proteins and eventually they lead up to the 40S ribosomal subunit. And in that complex is also the MET initiator tRNA, the, the tRNA that has a methionine, which is going to base pair with the AUG. And so this complex forms, and then the idea is that it moves down the mRNA in a process called scanning. It's an energy-dependent process because of this protein, EIF4A, is a helicase. It unwinds RNA. So if you put secondary structure, which is shown schematically there by that stem loop, the helicase can deal with it up to a certain free energy level. But if you make a very long stable stem loop, the ribosome will not get through it. So the helicase is to unwind secondary structures up to a certain point. That depends on ATP. Eventually, the 40S gets to the AUG, a protein called the IF1A is the AUG recognition protein. At that point, uh, when, when it reaches the, the MET tRNA base pairs with the AUG codon, uh, then energy, a lot of these subunits are released, uh, GTP is hydrolyzed to GDP, and the large subunit, the 60S subunit, comes in, and now we can start translation. And there you have the MET uh, in uh, the A side of the ribosome, the P side of the ribosome, and um, then, of course, you would read the next codon. All right, so that's basic translation in eukaryotic cells. Many viruses shut it off. I'll tell you some of the mechanisms by which they do that today. And this is an example uh, for poliovirus. So there on the left is a graph. These are cells either uninfected or infected with poliovirus. And we're looking at the rate of protein synthesis on the y-axis with hours after infection. And you can see that by two hours after infection, and this is a high multiplicity infection, so all the cells are infected, the rate of protein synthesis has been dramatically inhibited, whereas, of course, an uninfected cell keeps on making protein. And then after another hour, its, it's uh, protein synthesis rises again, and that's viral protein synthesis that is increasing. 
So somehow the virus is shutting off protein synthesis. I'll tell you in a moment how that happens. On the right is a protein gel that is looking at the same experiment. And here we're running extracts of the infected cells on a protein gel. And we're have, we have labeled the proteins with S35 methionine so we can make an autoradiogram and look at the proteins. So this is a very old gel from my lab where probably it was in 1990s. Nobody uses radioactivity anymore. I use old non-radioactive stuff. But back then, we, we used to do this. So here, time zero, the, it's a schmear of dark stuff because there are hundreds of proteins there, and they all blend in together. But you can see with hours after infection, starting at three hours, the schmear starts to go away. And then at five, there's not much cell protein left. But then you have all these viral proteins, which are labeled on the side, replacing it. So that's the shutoff of translation, and eventually, the cells die, and they don't make any protein because they're releasing virus particles. So that's viral inhibition of translation. This is poliovirus as an example, but many viruses do the same thing. There are a number of mechanisms that have been worked out for this inhibition, and they're summarized on this slide. And one of them is by cleavage of uh, this linker protein. So let's go back to the bottom and remind you that the way the 40S subunit is brought to the mRNA, EIF4E binds the cap, and then EIF4E binds the, the red protein, which is called EIF4G. It binds three, and it binds the 40S subunit. There's a protease produced in cells infected with polio and foot and mouth disease virus, both picornaviruses. It's called the 2A protease in polio and the L for foot and mouth that actually cleaves EIF4G right at the end terminus. And you can see it liberates part of EIF4G from the part where EIF4E attaches. And so that essentially shuts off the translation of any mRNA that has a cap, because if 4E binds the cap, there's no EIF4G there to bring in the 40S subunit. So that shuts off translation. And again, that's in cells infected with picornaviruses. There are a couple of other, there are two other mechanisms uh, shown here. It turns out that when EIF4E is phosphorylated, it binds with high affinity to the cap, and some viral infections induce dephosphorylation of EIF4E, like adenovirus and influenza virus, and that removes effectively 4E. And then the third mechanism shown here involves a regulatory protein called 4E BP1, which stands for 4E binding protein. There are two of them, one or two. And this binding protein would bind to EIF4E and prevent it from binding the, the, the uh, EIF4G, because it's binding to the same place, that little blib there that would bind to 4G. However, when 4EBP1 is phosphorylated, it cannot bind to 4E, and translation will proceed. So phosphorylated 4EBP1 is yeah, compatible with translation going on. Well, what some viruses do, polio, EMCV, both picornaviruses, they remove the phosphate from 4-EBP1. 4-EBP1 then binds 4-E and further inhibits cell translation. Now, so it does, polio is doing two things. It's cleaving 4-G, and it's also making sure that 4-E cannot bind 4-G uh, should there be any uncleaved 4-G left in the cell. And that effectively re reduces or eliminates translation by what we call 5 prime end dependent, where the cap is essential for recruiting the ribosome to the 5 prime end of the message. So you may wonder, well, how do these viruses translate their genomes if they're inactivating this process? And the answer is, well, they have a cap independent process, which is shown here. So on the top is the process we've just looked at, cap dependent. Translation or five prime end dependent translation. And below it is a new form which was discovered in viruses in the late 1980s. It's called internal initiation. And this happens on the genome of picornaviruses. All picornaviruses, including poliovirus, they have uh, this mechanism. It does not require a cap. All it needs is the C-terminus of EIF4G, which binds to the RNA directly, the 5' untranslated region of these RNAs. So there's the initiating AUG. 
that upstream of it is the 5 prime UTR. It's highly structured, and it can bind 4G directly, and you don't need that little end terminus, which is cleaved off and which has the EIF 4E binding site. And so that kind of initiation can take place even if 4G is cleaved. In fact, cleavage of 4G increases the affinity of the protein for this sequence on the RNA. This, by the way, is called an iris internal ribosome entry site. It was first found in polio and other coronavirus genomes. And since then, it's been found in a lot of other viral genomes. And some cellular RNAs have these internal ribosome entry sites as well. At the bottom is an example of an internal, of an iris in the genome of the flavivirus hepatitis C virus. And I show that to you because it's really interesting that the RNA, the, the iris can bind the ribosome directly. And to get translation, you just need two other proteins, EIF2 and EIF3. So this RNA has evolved over time to be able to interact directly with the ribosome, which is not the case for cap-dependent initiation. The ribosome doesn't bind the RNA, it binds a protein, which is recruited to the RNA. Even in the iris, the 40S, the type 1 or 2 iris, the 40S does not bind RNA directly. So it's a very unusual situation here. And as a consequence, the number of initiation proteins it needs are minimal, whereas 5 prime independent initiation requires all the eukaryotic initiation factors and uh, the, the type 1 or 2 iris needs all but EIF4E. So this is what an iris looks like. So this on the top is a figure I made in 1981 when I was a postdoc. I just sequenced the genome of poliovirus. It was the first animal virus genome sequenced. It took me one year of my life to do that. One year of running gels. You know, you could do this in 10 minutes. You put it in an envelope and send it out to a company. They'd have it to you the next day. 7,442 bases plus the poly A tail. And we had no PowerPoint at the time, so I, I printed this out on a computer. And we didn't have computers, actually. There was a computer in another building at MIT, and we had to hook up with a telephone to it. And we had this printer in a terminal that we... So I printed this out because we found when we did the sequence that the AUG is here, and there were 742 bases of nucleotides, which apparently didn't code for anything upstream. And I didn't know what that meant, and I never figured it out. Someone else did, but I wasn't really looking. But it turned out that is the sequence that lets the ribosome bind internally. And the clue is here that the viral RNA, which is shown as the green line, has a protein at the 5 prime end, VPG, which is the primer for RNA synthesis, right? It doesn't have a cap. And so people were always wondering, how does the genome get translated if there's no cap? Well, it turns out that this is the iris and it binds the ribosome directly, which was found out a number of years later. And so the translation of this RNA to make a long polyprotein, which is processed, happens when ribosomes bind internally, not at the 5 prime cap, because there is no 5 prime cap. So that's internal initiation. And now we know there are many different kinds of irises. We put them in types, one, two, three, four, five, six. There are, I think, two more. They all have different structures. They have no sequence in common. You can't scan. You can't do a blast search and look for an iris. You, you won't pick it up. You have to do structure analyses, and then you have to do an experiment to show that it can bind ribosomes internally. Anyway, there's the type 1, which is poliovirus and other enteros. The type 2 is encephalomyocarditis virus, which we've mentioned briefly. And then the uh, type 3 is hepatitis C virus and a couple of other viruses, type 4 and 5. And then the, the, the type 6 is, is here because it's from the genome of cricket paralysis virus, which I have to say because it's a virus that paralyzes crickets. One day, some farmer went out in the field in Australia, and his field was covered with dead crickets. And he brought one to a lab, and they found a virus in it, a polio-like virus that paralyzes the crickets. And I think people are wondering if they could use it for insect control. But it turns out that it has an iris at the 5 prime end, which is very much like the hepatitis C virus iris. And it doesn't need a lot of initiation proteins to work. Anyway, the way these work, at least for the type 2 iris, the EMCV, that red circle, that is where EIF4G binds to the structured RNA. The C-terminus of 4G binds there, and then 
it brings in the 40S subunit. So no cap is needed. The, the 40S subunit goes there, it scans just a short distance to the AUG, and then the big subunit comes and translation begins. So that is an unusual way of inhibiting cell translation and then having a very different mechanism of viral mRNA translation, which is via this sequence called the iris. There is another level of regulation of translation in which the host is trying to shut it down to prevent virus infection. And for this, we have to look at the initiation step. The initiation step of translation is regulated extensively in different systems. Elongation and termination is also regulated, but most of the mechanisms apply to initiation. What is initiation? Again, we have our mRNA, and we have the formation of the initiation complex. So the AUG has been reached. There's a met tRNA bound. A lot of other proteins have fallen off. And when this complex reaches the AUG, this GTP molecule, which is attached to the tRNA, it's hydrolyzed to GTP and released. That energy is needed for the subsequent joining of the 60S subunit. This GDP EIF2, which is normally bound to the tRNA, has to be recycled. The GDP has to be replaced with GTP so that it can go through another round of initiation on another mRNA. And what does that is another protein called EIF2B. GDP EIF2 binds to it. And then the GDP is exchanged for GTP. So this is a guanine exchange protein, very common in biology. You use hydrolysis of GTP to do something, and then you have to recycle the GDP out for a fresh GTP. So a GTP is now on EIF2, can join another met tRNA, and that can participate in another round of initiation. So it turns out that this is a very sensitive level of re regulation of translation. When cells are stressed, when they are subject to ER stress, if proteins are misfolding in the ER or a viral glycoprotein is being made in the ER, uh, the cells are stressed and a kinase called PERC is activated. If you deprive cells of amino acid, a different kinase is activated called GCN2. And if you infect the cell with a virus and it makes double-stranded RNA, which most viruses can do, that is also detected and activates another kinase called PKR. So these are stress response pathways which are aimed at shutting down translation. So, for example, if the cell is making misfolded proteins, why make more proteins until we can correct the problem? Or if there's no amino acids around, why should we make proteins? That would be silly. And the PKR response is, is an antiviral response. So the presence of double-stranded RNA is not something that cells have and it's usually viral. And so when that's sensed, it activates these pathways. These are all kinases, and their substrate is all the same. It's EIF2 alpha, which is a subunit of this blue protein EIF2. When, this, uh, when these stress conditions are encountered, these kinases are activated. They phosphorylate EIF2 on the alpha subunit. And so there you have GDP EIF2 at the bottom. That will still bind EIF2B to be recycled, but it never leaves. GDP EIF2P binds with such high affinity that GDP cannot be recycled. And what ends up happening is these GDP EIF2 phosphate molecules eventually bind up all the free EIF2B in the cell and translation stops because you can't recycle uh, the GDP anymore. So that's the mechanism of translation inhibition when cells are stressed and these kinases are activated. Most virus infections result in activation of either PERC or PKR. So typically envelope viruses, they're making glycoproteins in the ER, and that sense it activates PERC, phosphorylates EIF2 alpha, or double-stranded RNA, which as I said, most viruses make, also activates PKR and shuts down translation. And viruses need to get around this, otherwise they wouldn't exist. This is an incredibly powerful defense of the cell. Here's how PKR is activated. We're going to focus on PKR, which is again activated by double-stranded RNA. So here is what PKR uh, looks like. It's composed of a kinase domain, KD, 
and two double-stranded RNA binding motifs. So if there's double-stranded RNA around, these PKRs will bind via those double-stranded RNA binding motifs. And then the kinase domain will phosphorylate the kinase domain of a neighboring PKR. So multiple PKRs bind to this RNA. They phosphorylate each other. And then they're released, and they go and phosphorylate EIF2-alpha, and translation is shut down. That's the mechanism of PKR activation. It's phosphorylation by another PKR. On the top here uh, is just to show you that it can, be f it can be activated by a cell protein called PACT, which doesn't involve phosphorylation, and that can then induce apoptosis. So in tissues where you need to get rid of certain cell types, this is a mechanism for doing that. But viral activation is through phosphorylation. PKR is an interferon-induced protein. As we will see in a couple of weeks, a major early defense against virus infection is the production of interferon. And interferon itself is made when, it, when the cell senses that it's infected. We'll talk about how that works. Interferon then induces the synthesis of over a thousand different proteins which have antiviral activity, and one of them is PKR. But when PKR is made as a protein, it is inactive until it's phosphorylated or activated by PACT. And when it's activated by virus infection, that's phosphorylation, it leads to inhibition of host translation and apoptosis. The cell says, that's it, we're, we're leaving this earth, and maybe we will save the rest of the cells in this organism. So it's an altruistic thing, right? The, the idea is that you stop replication very early on and you save the host. As I said, this is a very powerful defense and every virus has at least one protein that counters it. And here's one from adenovirus, the genome is transcribed to make a small RNA called VARNA1, which prevents activation of PKR. The way it works is here's VA1, its structure. VA1, to remember, normally PKR binds double-stranded RNA and you need to have two neighboring PKRs bound to activate each other. Well, PKR binds one PKR molecule only, not two. So that one cannot autophosphorylate. There's nobody else around to phosphorylate it. So you get no phosphorylation of EIF2 and protein synthesis continues. So this one RNA made pretty early on by adenovirus, in adenovirus infected cells is how it counters PKR activation. But that's just one example. Every virus on the planet has to counter this in some way, otherwise it's out of existence. And these are just different ways that this is done. These are different viral proteins listed in this table. And then on the left here, we have PERC. So this, this is in the ER membrane. The ER lumen is up on top here. These two domains can sense protein misfolding, and when they do, they dimerize, and that causes activation of PERC by it phosphorylating itself. And remember, PKR is activated by binding to double-stranded RNA. So there are antagonists at different steps. So for example, the protein of vaccinia virus is a pseudo-substrate. It looks like EIF2. The virus makes a ton of this protein, and PKR is phosphorylating it, but ignoring the EIF2 in the cell because there's so much of this protein. Uh, there's a phosphatase that will take off the phosphate of EIF2 encoded in the herpes genome. There are proteins that block the activation of PERC. There are proteins that bind double-stranded RNA. So the virus is making double-stranded RNA. It's bound up by these viral proteins before it can activate PKR. There are RNA. We told you about VARNA, which binds PKR, so it can't be phosphorylated. And then there are antagonists of uh, the protein PKR itself which uh, do not have kinase activity. So a really amazing array of these have been discovered, which tells us that this is an important step and viruses have to get around it or they're dead in the water. Okay, our next question is, PKR is an interferon-induced enzyme that is activated by blank, leading to phosphorylation of blank and inhibition of translation. So we have choices GDP, EIF2-alpha, double-stranded RNA, EIF2-alpha, double-stranded RNA, EIF2B, single-stranded RNA, EIF2-alpha, or maybe none of those. All right, how did we do? Oh, 50, good, 51. 
B, right, most of you got B. So, PKR is an interferon-induced enzyme that is activated by double-stranded RNA, right? Two PKRs bind to double-stranded RNA, and that leads to phosphorylation of EIF2 alpha, and inhibition of translation. Well, the others, it doesn't, it's not activated by GDP, so we're, it is activated by double-stranded RNA, but it doesn't phosphorylate 2B, et cetera. The last aspect of translation also involves stress, but this is stress granules. When a cell is stressed, we learned that different EIF2 alpha kinases can be activated, but you can also get the formation of these stress granules. These are discrete foci in, in, in cells, so you can stress an uninfected cell with various chemicals, and they will make these punctate dots in the cytosol, which you can stain with antibodies against the components of them. They are called stress granules. They're made of a variety of proteins, including G3BP, TIA, TIAR, RAP55. And what happens is under stress, the cell puts its mRNAs into these, and that stops their translation. So here's some actively translated mRNAs under stress conditions. Phosphorylation of EIF2 alpha occurs, but in addition, these stress granules form, the RNAs are put in them. They have all the proteins still attached to them and ribosomal subunits, but translation ceases. Again, similar effect of shutting down translation after EIF2 phosphorylation. And of course, viruses get around this. They synthesize proteins that antagonize in different ways the formation of these. So for example, influenza virus, one of the viral proteins binds RAP55, which is a structural component of the stress granule, so it prevents stress granules from forming, and it prevents one of the viral proteins from getting in. That's the protein that's on the viral genome. Hepatitis C virus is interesting. As we'll see in a bit, the replication of this viral RNA requires lipid droplets. It occurs on the surface of lipid droplets, and what the virus has done here is assembling a series of viral proteins on the surface to serve as replication foci, but some of the components are stress granule components like G3BP. So again, it's preventing these from forming stress granules, and instead it's using them for its own uh, RNA synthesis. Poliovirus cleaves G3BP with one of its proteases, again preventing stress granule formation. And then we have a couple of other examples here. Uh, the alpha virus replication complexes contain G3BP, which sequesters and prevents from stress granules being formed. Same with Hunin virus, sequesters G3BP. And the flavivirus replication complex RNA structures also sequester TIAR and G3BP. So basically, different mechanisms for preventing the assembly of stress granules so that uh, translation can proceed. Otherwise, the viral genome can't be translated. All right, let's turn to metabolism. You, know, you remember this? All right, Krebs cycle, TCA cycle. Probably had to memorize this in high school. I know I did. So that's a great way to make energy, and which, which you need, of course. You need a lot of energy because you need a lot of stuff, nucleotides, amino acids, fatty acids. Look at 4 ATP, you need to make a single peptide bond. So making a lot of virus particles requires a lot of energy, so viruses manipulate these energy pathways and they change cell metabolism. Let me show you a couple examples of that. Here are some tissue culture plates infected with adenovirus, and the medium contains phenol red, a pH indicator. These are mock infected on the left, 24, 36, 48, 72 hours after infection. There's no change in the color, but adenovirus infected cells, the, the medium gets yellow, the pH is going down, and a mutant of adeno that doesn't replicate looks just like mock. The low pH is from production of lactic acid through glycolysis, you know, breakdown of glucose to get energy. And that's just graphed here, and actually it's a different parameter. Here we're looking at glucose consumption in these cells, and you can see the wild type virus is increasingly consuming glucose for energy production, whereas the mutant virus infected cells is not. And other viruses do this as well. Rhinoviruses depend on glucose as well. So what happens with glucose, of course, it's a major breakdown of your carbohydrate. Every time you eat pasta, glucose is a breakdown product. Glucose is imported into the cell by transporters called glutes, and then it goes through uh, this pathway, the glycolytic pathway. You end up with 
pyruvate and lactic acid. And the lactic acid is making the cell culture medium yellow. But along the way, you make energy. You can get two ATPs and two NADH just by conversion to pyruvate. pyruvate and there's other energy outputs as well. So viruses perturb this to their uses. And one thing I want to point out here before we go on, uh, you can shunt off from the glucose 6-phosphate intermediate to the pentose phosphate pathway. And this makes eventually nucleotides for DNA and RNA. And then, of course, acetyl-CoA is a precursor for fatty acid synthesis. And viruses are going to manipulate this, as you will see. Here are two herpes viruses. They have different effects on glycolysis. So human cytomegalovirus, the green arrow, stim it stimulates the uptake of glucose. And that leads to the production of more acetyl-CoA, which it needs to make membranes to put around its virus particle. Now, herpes simplex virus is also enveloped, but it doesn't affect the uptake of glucose. Instead, it affects this last step, glucose 6-phosphate to pyruvate. It blocks that and shunts this off into the ribose 6-phosphate pathways. The idea is that this, need, this virus is replicating faster than HCMV, so it needs more nucleotides. So even two viruses from one family can have different effects on a metabolic pathway like this one. Fatty acids, as I've said, are a component of membranes of virus particles, and so envelope viruses perturb uh, lipid biosynthetic pathways, but also non-envelope viruses do, as we'll see, because they are the components of replication pathways. Acetyl-CoA can't cross the mitochondrial membrane, as you probably know, and so pyruvate is imported, converted to acetyl-CoA, goes through the TCA cycle there, and then the citrate produced goes out, because that can cross the membrane, that will be reconverted to acetyl-CoA, and then that can be shunted off into the fatty acid pathway. And uh, in, in HCMV-infected cells, uh, most of this citrate goes to fatty acid synthesis for its membranes, and if you inhibit fatty acid synthase, the enzyme that converts malonyl to fatty acids, or acetyl-CoA carboxylase, if you inhibit those, say with small interfering RNAs, you will inhibit HCMV replication, telling you that this pathway is needed uh, to make particles. And this is not just something we see with HCMV. Uh, another mem activity of another part of this shuttle is, is also increased in cells infected with VSV, which needs a membrane as well. So viruses are manipulating lipid metabolic pathways. There are many examples of this, and they, they do have consequences for us. So if we are infected with viruses that are manipulating lipid synthesis pathways or others, they can have an effect. And here are two examples of viruses that infect the liver, hepatotropic viruses. They change glucose metabolism and as a consequence lead to diabetes. So you know that the liver is where glycogen and gluconeogenesis occur. And HBV infection uh, stimulates production of enzymes involved in gluconeogenesis because they would then use the glucose for energy or lipid production. And so you get type 2 diabetes, high levels of glucose in the blood, which cannot be controlled properly. Even though you may have normal insulin levels, it's making so much that it leads to type 2 diabetes. And hepatitis C infection also associated with type 2 diabetes, in this case, increases gluconeogenesis as well. So these perturbations, not, they don't just have uh, an effect on virus production, they can affect human health as well. So the TCA cycle, as you know, the input is pyruvate coming down from glucose, goes around the cycle and makes energy, but viruses pull things off of the cycle at different points. Uh, here, herpes simplex virus at the oxaloacetate step pulls it off to aspartate for the synthesis of pyrimidines and purines for DNA synthesis. And HCMV pulls citrate off to make fatty acids. And these viruses, to compensate for that, import glutamine down here. Otherwise, the cycle would stop if you just kept taking off these intermediates. So they import glutamine, which doesn't normally happen at levels seen in infected cells. And they can keep the cycle going. All right, it prevents halting the cycle so it can keep making precursors of pyrimidines and fatty acids. I want to talk a little bit about lipid metabolism. Cells tri triacylglycerols are the main store of lipids. These can be used for energy. You can oxidize them or uh, you can store it. 
And there's a triacylglycerol, of course. It's used in membrane biosynthesis of, us, of our cells and of viruses. And viruses can perturb and modulate this. They can modulate it for oxidative purposes to get energy, or they can make membrane structures. And the way this pathway would go in an uninfected cell, you know, lipoproteins are in our bloodstream. Uh, they bind to receptors on cell surfaces, converted to free fatty acids, which are imported into the cell, and converted to acyl-CoA. And then this goes through a series of steps and eventually made into lipid droplets, which are the store of these triacylglycerols. And viruses manipulate this pathway, as I said, to either get energy or to build membranes. And here's one example of how that happens in cells infected with human cytomegalovirus. And this, again, needs a lot of lipids for membranes. So it's going to induce the synthesis of very long chain fatty acids. You know, fatty acids can come in long and medium and short chains, and they have different purposes. And the way this works here is that there's a gene in the nucleus of our cells, or genes, that encode proteins involved in fatty acid and sterile biosynthesis. So you turn these on, you make fatty acids. The promoter requires a transcription protein called SREB P1M. So this comes in the nucleus, turns on transcription, you make fatty acids and sterols. And HCMV is going to turn on the production of that transcription protein. That transcription protein, SREBP1, is normally hung up in the ER. So there it is, SREBP1. It's a precursor, actually. That's what P stands for. And it's hung up by binding to two membrane proteins in the ER. When HCMV infects the cells, it causes ER stress. It causes dimerization of PERC. PERC then pulls this protein off of the complex in SIG1, and that now allows SREBP1 to pass through the Golgi to get processed and then go into the nucleus. All right, so it releases viral infection, releases SREPV1 from the ER, and it can pass through and eventually get processed and go in the nucleus. So the stress induced by HCMV infection has a beneficial effect on uh, this pathway. Hepatitis C virus also requires membranes. This is an envelope virus, but also has establishes replication uh, complexes on which RNA is synthesized. And these viruses have to balance oxidation versus synthesis because they do need some energy, but they do need to make structures. And so the, here you can, in this uh, immunofluorescence, these cells, these are hepatocytes in culture. They're stained with a dye which binds lipids. And you can see there are very low levels of lipids in mock infected cells. And then in virus infected cells, there are many more and they're focally concentrated. This particular transcription factor uh, would normally be going out of the nucleus and that would be shutting off the production of SREBP and lipogenesis. And so hep C infection keeps that in the nucleus, so it makes more lipids. And if you knock down uh, this particular transcription factor, FOX01 is a transcription factor, it inhibits hep C uh, replication. So that's biosynthesis or lipogenesis. On the right is fatty acid oxidation, which is carried out by genes also encoded in a nuclear genome. And the transcription factor there is FOXA2. Hep C infection downregulates FOXA2 to reduce the amount of fatty acid that is oxidized. And if you overproduce FOXA2 in cells, inhibits hep C replication. And so the virus has to balance oxidation versus lipid synthesis, depending on what's required, and it can be a dynamic situation. And I just want to remind you that this biosynthetic pathway leading to lipogenesis results in the accumulation of these lipid droplets, which are stores of lipids uh, in the cells. What do you use these for in cells besides making membranes? You also make replication complexes. And here's, a, again, polio infected and uninfected cells in culture. These are stained again with a dye that stains lipid. And you can see in the mock infected cells, there are diffuse areas of lipids throughout the cell. When you infect them with polio, they become coalesced and increase in intensity. And what uh, infection does is to induce the synthesis of these RNA replication complexes. It does so by tethering these lipid droplets 
to the rep replication compartment membrane via a couple of viral proteins, and it steals triglycerides from the droplets, converts them to phospholipids, and builds the membrane with it. And that membrane becomes double membrane. The virus replicates its RNA on it, and, and virus particles are assembled. And they can be released either from within vesicles or uh, as naked particles. So the, again, the virus is inducing the synthesis of lipids. You get more lipid droplets, and is stealing from them to make replication compartments. Similar situation for hepatitis C virus in infected cells. It induces the formation of many intracellular vesicles that you can see in this reconstruction in the upper left. Early in infection, in the replicative phase, these vesicles, by the way, are derived from the endoplasmic reticulum. You can see they're spherical vesicles, and the viral replication proteins are bound to them. And the, the yellow protein is the RNA polymerase, and the other proteins are accessory proteins needed. And what is going on here is the viral RNA, the plus-strand RNA, is being copied into double-stranded RNA, which will eventually be copied again. And that happens uh, in these membranous vesicles. And there's, there's an opening on one side. Later in infection, when assembly is required of new virus particle, and lipid droplets are found in these same structures. And of course, remember, the virus is inducing the synthesis of lipid droplets. And on their surfaces are a variety of viral proteins. You can see the colored ovals there. And the RNA that was previously made in the vesicle is now being assembled into a particle. And this is actually going to bud into the lumen of this vesicle and eventually be transported up to the cell by the vesicular transport pathway. So these vesicles are sites of genome replication and assembly as well. And the last thing I want to tell you is so cool. It's a plant virus. We don't have many plant virus examples in this course. And this is a, a virus that infects tomatoes, tomato bushy stunt virus. And it is an RNA virus. And it induces membranous vesicles derived from the ER in which RNA synthesis occurs. And these vesicles are shown by electron micro, uh, by uh, immunofluorescence microscopy here. Uh, the, the vesicles are stained green, and then the viral protein is stained blue. So you can see it's full of viral protein. And the viral polymerase is in here making an RNA copy of the genome. But what is very cool is that uh, this viral protein, P33, recruits pyruvate kinase into the vesicle, which makes ATP needed for RNA synthesis. So rather than depending on obtaining the, the ATP from elsewhere. It's making it right there in the vesicle by interaction of the enzyme itself with a viral protein. It's a really neat uh, example of how the virus can modulate the metabolic landscape of the cell for its own purposes. Okay, so that gives you an idea of the different pathways that viruses take to make the cell suitable for its own replication. So next time we'll start talking about how viruses cause disease, we'll start with infection basics.